What's up everyone, welcome back to a brand new video. When Goku was sent to Earth, there were a lot of variables about how he would land there or where he'd even end up at. So many things could have gone wrong, but not just that, many things could have also gone different. And that's what we're here to cover today. Instead of Goku landing on Earth, what would have changed if King Kai tried to intervene, diverting Goku's pod to his planet? I'm not sure if this will turn into a full scenario or not, but let's set a like goal of 3000 likes, and if we hit that, I'll create another part to this series. Anyways, let's begin. Just like normal, from planet Vegeta, Kakarot's pod is sent away. It's on a course for Earth. Of course, the Galactic Patrol did pick up on this, that's why Jaka went there in the first place. But there's another person who is worried, that is King Kai. There aren't too many planets with life in Universe 7, and at least for his quadrant, King Kai wants to do his best to protect it. A Saiyan being sent to Earth is a recipe for disaster. Since he's so concerned about this, he decides to redirect the pod, bringing it to his planet. He doesn't intend on raising this kid, no. His goal is to kill it. Working his magic, the pod is then teleported away, crossing realms as it goes to King Kai's planet. Inside, of course, is a baby Saiyan, seemingly a low-class one. King Kai's gonna get this over with quick. But for some reason, he really can't bring himself to do it. He knows how the Saiyans are, and he knows that this should be done. But there's something really holding him back. It's a Saiyan, but it's a Saiyan baby. He begins thinking, there has to be another way, right? But then he realizes, there's one much better option that he could do. Instead of eliminating the Saiyan, he'll raise it. They do need some more good warriors in Universe 7. A lot of the strong ones are evil. So, not only would this mean King Kai doesn't have to do this, but he would also be creating a strong warrior that could help him. He reads the kid's memories, finding out that his name is Kakarot. His parents seemingly were good people. Usually when a Saiyan is sent to a planet, they intend to destroy it. But this one is different. By now he's aware of planet Vegeta's destruction. And that's exactly why this child was sent away. He's a survivor, one of the last Saiyans left. This makes Hinkai feel better about his choice. He was never a danger to Earth. Well, at least not directly. And he can't help but feel bad for the parents. It's rare that a Saiyan would show some sort of compassion like that. So, this kid, his name is Kakarot, he seems to have a lot of potential. Although, of course, he is rowdy. But Kinkai can fix that. As the years go by, Kakarot becomes much smarter and a little bit more calm. Although he does retain some of his Saiyan nature. There was one little precaution that Kinkai had to take, that is, removing the tail. For Kakarot, the tail does serve as a possible hindrance. Not only is it a weak spot for Saiyans, but he could turn into a great ape and lose control. King Kai could train him to have him control this form, but there's not really space on his planet for that. Besides, one monkey living there is enough. He doesn't need a giant one on top of that. Besides becoming smarter, Kakarot grows much stronger than normal. He still has that same peaceful environment that he grew up with on Earth, but he has the benefit of gravity. As with every other Saiyan, he's actually growing up with 10 times gravity, which is what Planet Vegeta had. His growth isn't hindered in any way, and this of course means he'd grow a lot stronger. Kakarot continues this growth, but meanwhile on Earth, things are still happening, although a lot differently than normal. Of course, Grandpa Gohan gets to survive here, living a relatively peaceful life, but he's not really too important to the story here. And surprisingly, Bulma also isn't really too important, except for this small part. Her journey would likely go a lot smoother, and even though Goku isn't there to help her, there's a fair chance that she gets her Dragon Balls. Between her wish for a lifetime supply of strawberries and a boyfriend, she chooses the strawberries. Inadvertently, this means that the Pilaf gang doesn't get the wish. So, it's a win-win. She gets her wish, and the Pilaf gang is stopped. For the time being, at least. But later on, there's a bigger issue. The Red Ribbon Army would start making themselves known. And naturally, with all their power, they make great progress collecting the Dragon Balls. And this is going to be an issue that Earth can't really solve itself. However, King Guy has the perfect answer. He asks Kakarot if he wants to go on a mission, testing out his power on Earth to stop some bad people. Of course, Kakarot would jump at the opportunity for this. Not only is it a chance to have a fight, but also he'll get to test his power and visit a new planet. Kakarot is sent there, and as you could probably imagine, he stops the army relatively easily. In canon, Goku did it pretty casually. But this time with Kakarot? It's no contest, he could do it in his sleep. And naturally, this wouldn't really go unnoticed. Some random warrior shows up one day and dismantles an entire army. There may even be some surveillance footage of it from the Red Ribbon Army. People want to figure out what happened, and all they see is a blur moving around. Speculation goes wild, and no one really knows what happened. One person that hears about it is Krillin, and he's pretty curious. From what little they see in the footage, it seems like it was some kid. And this actually kind of motivates Krillin. He wonders if he can get as strong as that kid did. Although he doesn't know who that person is. He could be a god. He could be an alien. Or he could be something completely different. Naturally, Krillin is still with Master Roshi. There's no reason he wouldn't be, and he'd kind of be the main character for Earth at this point. He does still show the same promise, and he wants to get a lot stronger. So now he wants to learn more about this godly figure. Roshi directs him to Korin, and Krillin climbs up the tower. Krillin meets Korin, and Korin actually knows somewhat about this warrior. 
but he'll only tell Krillin if Krillin passes the test. So, for days Krillin tries to steal the water from Korin. Eventually, he'd probably be able to. And Korin agrees to train Krillin, as well as telling him somewhat about that godly figure. He does confirm that it was someone sent from the beyond, a warrior from other worlds sent by King Kai. Sadly, Krillin's not going to meet him anytime soon because that's so high up the chain of command. But Korin says maybe Krillin can work his way up. Krillin continues his quest for power. Eventually, the 22nd World Tournament rolls around, and after his training with Korin, Krillin's actually more than enough to defeat Ten Shinhan, who would likely be the only challenge for him. Roshi would probably enter as Jackie Chun, but he'd notice that Krillin is way out of his league now. He's proud of his student, and he's still motivated to go further, so Roshi's not too worried. And while things seem okay, of course, King Piccolo and his crew are about to arrive. Tambourine attacks Krillin, but Krillin is actually able to defend this time. He thankfully gets to live, but now he has this huge challenge in front of him, and he doesn't have as many allies to help. Bulma, of course, is not involved, and Yamcha probably wouldn't be either. Tenshinhan and Chaochu probably would help, though. Even though Krillin probably won't have the same impact on them as Goku did, they do have a common enemy now. So, surprisingly, the Turtle School and the Crane School team up. Piccolo must be stopped at all cost. They dismantle Piccolo's forces, which isn't really too hard, but it seems like they have a lot of the Dragon Balls already. They do have a great plan, though. If they're able to get the Dragon Balls, they can wish to seal Piccolo away. If not, they'll be out of luck. Piccolo will be too strong for them to defeat. The group is able to get most of the Dragon Balls before Piccolo, and now they'll have to lure him in to get the rest of them. This plan ends up working. Krillin and Tenshinhan distract Piccolo. They can't really contend with him in terms of power, but they hold him off as Chaozu goes and steals the wish. King Piccolo is sealed away, and it seems the job is done. All is going pretty good. Earth remains safe, and Kakarot is watching along. King Kai was prepared to have him intervene, but they're lucky that they didn't have to. They're both pretty impressed with the people on Earth. It's not so often where you see an Earthling that strong like Krillin. As we move forward, Krillin would eventually end up training with Kami. Kami would still be alive here because Piccolo was sealed away, not killed. And Krillin would literally move his way up. Let's go back to King Kai's planet. Kakarot is of course growing stronger still, and he's even beginning to learn some new techniques. He has brief control of the Kaioken. Now that he's aged up somewhat, his body can actually handle it, although he has to pace himself and work into it. But what intrigues Kakarot more is that guy on Earth, Krillin. King Kai has word that he's been training with Kami, and Kakarot gets curious. You know what, I'm now just realizing that everyone has K names. King Kai, Kakarot, Krillin, Kami. Weird coincidence. They're gonna keep a close eye on this Krillin guy. More time passes, and eventually the 23rd World Tournament happens. There's no Piccolo Jr. this time. And as for Ten Shinhan, he's not as bad as he was before. He's kind of rivals with Krillin. And naturally, Krillin would end up winning this tournament. There's not really too many strong people there. Clearly, a lot has changed on Earth. Yamcha isn't involved, and he's probably still abandoned. As for Bulma, once she got her wish, she was satisfied, and she grows up with a normal life. Chi-Chi may continue fighting, but I'm not really too sure how long that would go on for. So, she's out of the picture too. Things are peaceful, but pretty tame. At least, for the time being. Of course, peril will strike eventually. Even though Kakarot didn't land on Earth, there's someone that thought he did. Raditz. He arrives on Earth, looking around for strong powers. On his scouter, he sees one in the couple hundred range. This power is kind of weak in comparison to Raditz. Only about 600, but it's the strongest that he can find, so he pursues it. Raditz lands at Kami House, and the only people there are Krillin and Roshi. They can tell that Raditz has malicious intent. And since this guy is so strong, he wonders if he knows anything about Kakarot. He clearly isn't an average Earthling, and not just because of the fact that he has no nose. When Krillin hears the name Kakarot, he goes pale. This guy's evil, and he's looking for Kakarot. He doesn't know him, but Krillin does know Kakarot's name by now. Does this mean Kakarot's a bad guy? He tells Raditz he's not sure, but he's heard stories about Kakarot. Raditz interrogates him, seeing if he can get more info, but Krillin doesn't have any. This only angers Raditz. He feels that Krillin is lying. Whatever, though, he prepares to destroy Krillin. But just before he can attack, someone taps him on the shoulder. He turns around and sees. Standing there in some odd clothing is someone that looks relatively like his father. Ah, this must be him. Kakarot is here now, with Roshi and Krillin looking in amazement. Raditz is happy to see his brother, and he seems pretty strong. He wonders what's up with the outfit, but doesn't care. He asks Kakarot to join the Saiyans, and Kakarot asks what they plan to do with Earth. Of course, Raditz plans to destroy it, and he tells Kakarot flat out, thinking that he'll agree with it. They'll kill everyone on there, and then sell the planet. That's all that Kakarot needs to hear. Raditz sticks out his hand, asking his brother to shake it. Kakarot sticks his out, but it turns into a fist as he then knocks Raditz far away, flying across the ocean into land nearby. Kakarot asks Krillin if he could fly, and tells him to follow along. Krillin, of course, agrees, now seeing that Kakarot is clearly good. They arrive at a crater and see Raditz over there. Weakly, Raditz stands up, angered at what his brother did. All right, if he wants a fight, Raditz will give him that. Kakarot's clearly strong, so he can't screw around. Raditz creates an artificial moon, and then turns into a great ape. Krillin's obviously pretty terrified, 
and Kakarot asks if he can help with something. He'll fight off Raditz, but he wants Krillin to cut off his tail if he can. Kakarot will be the distraction as Krillin attacks. Krillin clearly would be nervous, but he agrees. Activating Kaioken, Kakarot surpasses Raditz in terms of power, although it's not something he can use for long, which is why he needs Krillin's help. He fends off Raditz, landing some strong attacks. Raditz loses track of Krillin, not focusing on him. And this is perfect, Krillin has a great technique just for this. In his hands, he charges a Kienzan, aiming for Raditz's tail. While he's distracted, he launches the disc. The Kienzan cleanly slices through it. As Raditz turns back into his normal form, Kakarot powers down, happy that Krillin helped. He actually chuckles a bit. Really, he could have done this himself, but he wanted to see what Krillin was made of. This was more so a test. With a single attack, he eliminates Raditz, not caring that they're related. Of course, Krillin has a lot of questions, so Kakarot explains everything. He definitely sees the potential in this Krillin guy. And for the next year, they're going to have to spend some time together. Before Raditz died, he does mention that the Saiyans are going to come to Earth soon. And this will be a perfect test for Kakarot's power, as well as seeing if Krillin can train to this level too. Krillin goes with Kakarot to train for Kaioken and prepare for the Saiyans. He's heard of King Kai and Kakarot, but he's actually amazed to be here. The gravity would be really hard for him to get adjusted to at first, but he does adapt. It takes some time, but still, he's eventually able to handle it and then begins his training. King Kai is pretty impressed too, although he's not nearly as strong as Kakarot. For an Earthling, this guy's tough. Clearly, he's also very smart, a tactician at heart. Kakarot does most of the training, while King Kai steps in at some points. This is more than he can ever wish for. Of course, he does have a close connection with Kakarot, but he's also glad that he grew up into a strong warrior. But now, there's another one too. The North Galaxy now has two great people that he can work with. And even better, for any other world tournaments, this will really help him. The tournaments aren't his main priority, but hey, it's a nice bonus for him. Over this year, Kakarot and Krillin become good friends. Even with these odd circumstances, they're still going to be best pals. Despite all the major changes in the story. After this year of training, the two head back to Earth. And there's no games here. They're not going to play around with the Saiyans and look for a good fight. Vegeta and Nappa arrive, surprised to see only two people standing against them. One being Kakarot in that same weird outfit, and then another being some short, bald Earthling who doesn't have a nose for some reason. They send out the Cybermen, but with one swipe, Kakarot eliminates them all. He doesn't want any games. Fine, if he wants to play like that, they'll play along. Nappa steps up first, with Krillin ready to take him on. Krillin activates Kaioken and immediately goes for the kill. Nappa was no trouble for him. As quickly as it started, it ends. Vegeta's amazed, but he can't get distracted. He's facing Kakarot at the same time. And Vegeta actually feels nervous. Kakarot seems to be casually keeping up with him. While Vegeta's at his max, being careful, he's not going to take any chances. Vegeta throws up an artificial moon, which isn't surprising to Kakarot or Krillin. Vegeta knows to protect his tail this time, but Kakarot actually laughs at this. He's still confident that he can defeat Vegeta, and if anything, this allows him to test out some new techniques. Kakarot fights Great Ape Vegeta, and Vegeta's amazed. How did low-class Saiyan get this strong? Of course, Kakarot is way stronger than Goku was in canon, not only due to growing up in time stand gravity, but also having a great teacher and a good training partner for a year. By this point, he actually has Kaioken up to times 20, but he really only needs times 10. Let's actually look at some power levels so we can get a sense of his power. Kakarot's at 30,000, while Krillin's around 10,000. As you can probably tell, this is kind of overkill, which is why Vegeta needed to transform. Krillin has Kaioken up to times 3, which would mean his power would increase to 30,000, meaning he'd be matching Kakarot in terms of power. Although, that's just Kakarot's base power. Once he activates Kaioken times 20, well, it's pretty much game over for anyone else. His power source is 600,000, a pretty huge number. But for Vegeta, he's not going to have to use that much power. Instead, he goes to times 10. He easily is able to outpace Vegeta. And he's actually enjoying this fight. Krillin's confused as to why he's not ending it faster, but it's mainly due to Kakarot's Saiyan blood. It's the first time pretty much ever where he's had a fun fight. But this doesn't really mean he's going to screw around. He heavily overpowers Great Ape Vegeta, outspeeding and outmaneuvering him. Vegeta does seem dangerous and he might blow up Earth, so Kakarot's gonna end this. He flies around Vegeta's back and hits him right there in his spine, causing Vegeta to flip over and crash into the ground. He's gonna have to use a lot of power from a beam to kill Vegeta, and with Vegeta on the ground, that'll be tough. He doesn't want Earth to get harmed, so he actually has the perfect opportunity to use a new technique. Vegeta gets up and jumps up towards Kakarot. He stretches his hand out, ready to grab him. But as he jumps up, Kakarot lifts one of his hands up, smirking. He asks Krillin to lend him some energy, as well as the planet itself. In his hands, he begins charging a very small spirit bomb. With how much time he spent with Kenkai, he has perfect mastery over this technique, being able to quickly and efficiently charge it. As Vegeta flies up towards Kakarot, he launches a beam from his mouth. 
And in response, Kakarot throws a spirit bomb. It cuts through Vegeta's blast, disintegrating it, and flies directly into Vegeta's mouth. Right as Vegeta's hand is about to grab Kakarot, it goes right through him. His hand begins disintegrating, as well as the rest of him. He then screams as he explodes from the spear bomb destroying him. Earth has defended against the Saiyans, and it seems all is going to go well now. Krillin and Kakarot congratulate each other, happy to have done this. So what would happen next? Well, not really much. Since Kakarot would have completely destroyed the Red Ribbon army, there'd be no androids either. And without any Saiyans or Namek, there's not going to be any Frieza, at least not yet. But on that note, I guess we can leave off here for now. So as mentioned already, there's no androids here. No 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, anything. There's no future trunks either because with no androids, there's no need for a timeline anomaly. That's due to what happened in the first part, where Kakarot completely eliminated the Red Ribbon army. Kind of future-proofing Earth in a way by preventing this. But of course, the androids are far from the last enemies that are faced in Dragon Ball. This does mean we're going to have a considerable time skip though. At some point over this time, Kakarot's tail suddenly just grows back. This hasn't happened to him yet, he got it removed before, but now it's back somehow? So, why is this? While we didn't see it with Vegeta or Gohan after a certain point, this still has happened before with Goku and Gohan. And that hasn't happened for Kakarot yet in this scenario. Plus, I wanted to do it because it makes the design look nicer, and because I have some plans for it. Tails barely have logic in the show as is, so why not here as well? Following the Saiyan Saga, Krillin would occasionally leave Earth to train, while also bringing along his rival Ten Shinhan. King Kai's fine having those two students from Earth. They both seem very promising, and Krillin was already great as is. Ten definitely had a weird upbringing, but he has a good heart now. And by all means, he is pretty strong for an Earthling. After seeing his friend Krillin getting so strong, he kind of wanted to get in on that too. Thankfully, Kami and King Kai were gracious enough to allow this. But the thing is, there's been way more years that have passed since the Saiyan Saga. At least, peaceful years. The next thing would naturally be the Buu Saga, which we'll cover later on in this video. And that's over a decade away from when the Saiyan Saga happened, so there's a lot that we're going to need to cover from that beforehand. Training goes very well on King Kai's planet, but everyone eventually starts seeing diminishing gains, especially Kakarot. King Kai has a great solution though, for Krillin and Tenshinhan. They can train with some people in Otherworld. Kakarot does that too, but King Kai has better plans for him. By now Kakarot's well aware that there's other Kais, people above King Kai even. King Kai is so impressed with the student that he decides to take him to the Supreme Kai. And honestly Kakarot is kind of nervous about this. Someone above King Kai. He never could have even imagined that a few years ago. But he looks forward to it. He's going to get a lot stronger by doing this. And to be fair, it's pretty beneficial for King Kai since his planet is kind of small, and they're not growing fast anymore on there. This means he'll finally have some more space there that he desperately needs. Kakarot starts training with Shin and Kibito, who are able to tell him more about his Saiyan heritage. They wonder if there's a way for Kakarot to grow stronger, so they look into this. Sure, Kaioken is great for him and he's been able to push it up to really high levels. By now, he probably even has times 100, which is insane. But it's not like he can use that forever. Kaioken is very strenuous. And even at lower levels like times 20, Kakarai just can't keep Kaioken activated permanently. They need to figure out ways to strengthen his base form first, and possibly see if there's any other steps for Saiyans. Kakarot first tries pulling the Z Sword, but he definitely won't be able to do it just yet. But Shin eventually figures out something interesting. After researching with some help from the Namekians, who are safe by the way because Frieza never attacked their planet, Shin found out something really weird about Saiyans that no one knew before. Something called Super Saiyan and Super Saiyan God. Super Saiyan God seems kind of impossible right now though because apparently to get it, you need five other Saiyans and only one exists at the moment. And the only other way to do that is for Kakarot to get God Key somehow and that'll take a lot of time. But Super Saiyan, that actually seems doable. They don't know much about it but it's apparently some sort of legend. A Saiyan transformation that can be accessed through anger or something and it greatly increases the Saiyan's power once they access it. Still, information is sparse and vague about it, but it seems like there's enough to prove that it does exist. Thank you, Namekian Book of Legends. Because of you, Kakarot gets Super Saiyan in the scenario. Well, he at least works towards it first. And with his fighting expertise and some help from Shin and Kibito, he does get a lot stronger and eventually accesses this form. He can tell it's not as strong as Kaioken times 100, but it's stronger than many other multiplications of Kaioken. And it's way less strenuous, even in Grade 1. Just like he was able to practice and perfect Kaioken somewhat, he wants to try and do that with Super Saiyan. It's a smart idea that'll allow him to use it more efficiently. And efficiency seems to be key with his training right now, so he decides to do this. It takes some more time, but eventually he does get grade 4 of Super Saiyan, struggling to figure out if he can go any higher. At least, any higher in terms of Super Saiyan. He did find another way to surpass his limits, but he's not too sure about how effective it is. Although he tests it out occasionally. And while he is with Shin and Kibito now, King Kai still does keep up with Kakarot. Obviously, he's a student and pretty much his adoptive son, and he's amazed at how strong Kakarot has gotten in this short period of time. While Krillin and Ten are very strong, 
and King Kai could use them, King Kai has something that he wants to use Kakarot for. Something that the both of them will have fun with, the Otherworld Tournament. This is something that Kakarot has no experience with. Remember, he wasn't raised on Earth, so he has no experience with tournaments. He's only ever sparred with his friends or fought people who are threats to Earth. But a tournament definitely does sound fun, and it'll be a great way for him to test out his new powers. It's been very peaceful lately, so he kinda does need this. So, he ends up taking some time away from his normal training to go to the tournament. And in the meantime, Krillin and Ten decide to head back to Earth. They heard a tournament is coming up there soon, too. And one thing I want to mention here, I know in the anime, the Otherworld Tournament did happen before the Boo Saga. But it's not really canon anyway, and for the sake of the scenario, I feel like it would be more interesting to have it take place at the same time. And you'll see why as the scenario goes on. Krillin and Ten head back to Earth, going to see their respective masters again. Thankfully, once again, Roshi and Shen are on good terms. After the whole King Piccolo thing, they put aside their differences once and for all. I mean, there was a lot to work out, but after all these years, I feel like eventually they'd have to put the past behind them. But that's just a little side note. The main focus here are obviously Krillin and Ten, who do end up entering the tournament. And clearly, there's not too many strong fighters on Earth right now. There's one guy, Mr. Satan, who's apparently been the World Tournament Champ for a while, but in terms of strength, he's nowhere near them. But there is someone else entering the tournament that wasn't there before. Well, with both their students gone, Roshi and Shen eventually stumbled upon a new student, through their indirect connection with Korin, a bodyguard of Korin's tower who was pretty young before but is now an adult, and this is the first time Krillin and Shenhan meet him, since the Red Ribbon arc went so differently. Of course, I'm referring to Upa, and thank god I am finally able to use him in a scenario. I mean, Earth kinda did need a new fighter, some new blood that we haven't seen before. He's actually made some great progress, and although he doesn't match Ten Shenhan and Krillin in terms of power, he is very strong now. This will be his first time entering the tournament. And I'll be honest, he's not gonna be too involved in this part, but we're gonna see a lot of him later on. So, be sure to keep him in mind. The tournament starts pretty much without a hitch. And you know what, just for fun, even Roshi enters. He may as well have some fun too. Those four of course make it the farthest in the tournament, but naturally the final match is probably gonna end up being between Krillin and Ten Shinhan. Everything's gone pretty smoothly so far, but there is still a threat looming about. Those weird guys that got taken out at the first parts of the tournament, Spopovich and Yamu. Something about them didn't seem right, at least not in comparison to where they were before. They are still possessed by Bobbity and they're waiting for the time to strike. Although they haven't really found any strong fighters yet, they were waiting to see who gets to the finals to actually steal energy then. Krillin and Ten are ready to have a good fight, but then suddenly, Krillin is attacked. Since he's the strongest here, Spopovich and Yamu decide to take his energy, as soon as he and Ten power up into Kaioken. Huh, that kinda rhymes. But the thing is, they're not gonna be successful here. Shin and Kibito aren't here to help. And that's because Ten and Krillin were expecting this. They actually got this information from Kakarot before they headed back to Earth. They knew someone was gonna attack, but didn't know when, so they were prepared for this. And that's why they went Kaioken right away, they wanted to draw out whoever was going to attack them. Shin and Kibito feel that they can handle it on their own, and regardless, Bobbidi might not even be able to get enough energy if he needs. So when Spopovich and Yamu jump out at Krillin, he gets out of the way quickly as Ten Shinhan defeats them, knocking them clean to the ground. Immediately they try and escape, and those two end up following. Oh yeah, and before they leave, Ten decides to make things easy and tell everyone he concedes, letting Krillin be declared the winner of the tournament, even though he technically left too. I mean, let's be honest, he was going to win anyways. While those two face Boba Fish and Yamu, another tournament is happening in Otherworld, and it's definitely way more peaceful. With Super Saiyan, Kakarot's very strong now. He was before, but this is something else. It's crazy how strong it makes him. But there's one opponent that gives him trouble, that being Pycon. See, Kakarot has a pretty big disadvantage here. Everyone in this tournament is dead besides him. And as we've seen, being dead actually helps you with fighting, especially when using something strenuous like Super Saiyan or Kaioken. But not just that, Pycon is pretty powerful, and the fight between the two is pretty interesting. It's a huge spectacle, and Kakarot is forced to break out something that he didn't use before. He clued King Kai in on this, but this is the first time he's actually using it in practice. If he were dead, it would be way easier, and he'd be able to use this at higher levels, but he's still gonna break it out regardless. With his now perfect control of Super Saiyan, he stacks Kaioken on top of it, going Super Kaioken. This gives him a massive increase in power. It's the multiplier of Super Saiyan plus whatever multiplier of Kaioken he's using. And with how good he is with Kaioken and Super Saiyan, let's say he's going to be using times 10 here. This helps him a lot against Pycon, and this technique is very taxing on his body, but it helps him win the tournament. But this Pycon guy interests him a lot. He wants to see him again afterwards. I mean, that strength isn't something that Kakarot can just ignore. He begins talking with Pycon after the tournament, and the two are very respectful towards each other, acknowledging the other's strength. Pycon shows interest in that Kaioken technique. King Kai is very happy to hear this because it's something he can hold over West Kai. Would you look at that? West Kai's student is interested in North Kai's technique. But King Kai's laughter is cut short. He gets some news from Shin and Kibito about Earth. It seemed everything was going well, but Shin mentions that someone very strong is there. And even with Krillin and Ten Shinhan's great power, this fighter, Deborah, he poses a pretty considerable threat. 
Krillin and Ten are en route to Bobdi's ship, and Shin's worried about their safety, and he asks King Kai if he could bring Kakarot with him. Luckily, this tournament just finished, so King Kai runs over to Kakarot and tells him. Sadly, this meeting between him and Pycon is cut short, but they'll meet later on once again. Shin teleports in, surprising all the other Kais there, immediately bringing Kakarot to Earth. Ten and Krillin are happy to see him, glad to have him here to help, and Shin fills him in on everything. Deborah sounds kind of concerning, but with Kakarot here, they may be okay. They arrive at the ship, and Bobbity seems pretty angry. Spopovich and Yamu got no energy at all, so they're executed right away. But of course, Bobbity knows other fighters are there, and he sticks Deborah on them immediately. Deborah sees Shin and jumps up right towards him, but midair, he's then slammed down by Kakarot, who goes Super Saiyan right away. Shin's worried that Kakarot may be giving a bit of energy, but he promises he'll finish this quickly. Deborah is angered by the sneak attack. Had he not been off guard, this wouldn't have happened, and he gets up ready to face this Kakarot guy. He sees the clothes he has and the symbol on his chest. A student of the Kai's. He's ready to fight and ready to draw this out for as long as he needs. But Kakarot's not going to let that fly. For a very brief period, he jumps into Super Kaioken, but just Kaioken times two. Little side note, this means he basically gets the same boost as Super Saiyan 2. But he doesn't want to give off too much energy, and this should be enough to defeat Deborah. He catches Deborah off guard, and with one powerful hit, he knocks the King of the Demon Realm unconscious. And as he falls to the ground, Tenshinhan and Krillin finish him off, killing him. Bobbity watches from his ship terrified. All he has left are those two schmucks, Pui Pui and Yakon, who are immediately defeated as the fighters enter the ship. He did get a bit of energy from Kakarot, but it's not nearly enough, and he panics trying to figure out another option. Maybe he can possess one of the fighters, but no luck. Krillin's obviously not gonna go Majin, and Ten's heart has hardened since he's been evil, so he's resilient to this too. Ironically enough, Kakarot would probably be the most susceptible due to his Saiyan nature, but that's still not gonna happen. He gave up his Saiyan ways a while ago since he was a kid and his mental fortitude is way too much for Bobbity to break through. So, Bobbity's ship is blown up, killing Bobbity inside. The only thing left is Boo's egg, which Shin gladly takes away to make sure it's safe. He thanks everyone for their help and is glad it went so smoothly, and he's sorry for sending Krillin and Tenshin on in without knowing that Deborah was there. They're a little bummed that they didn't get to finish their match at the tournament, but it's fun. They can't go all out there anyways. It wouldn't be as fun without them being able to use their full abilities. But maybe Shin will allow them to fight on a place where they can do that? Oh, of course. As a reward, they get to fight each other on the Sacred World of Kai's without worrying about destroying anything around them. As I've said, of course Krillin is going to win, but this allows the both of them to have a fun fight for once in a while, with Kakarot and Shin getting to see how far these two have gotten. And that's when Kakarot brings up the idea of Pycon training here. He mentions Pycon to Shin and how strong he is. Maybe he'd be a good student here. And this is intriguing. They'll definitely have to look into that. And of course, they do. Over the next few years, Krillin and Ten move out to training here. With all their training in Otherworld, they do know some pretty interesting things. Including fusion, but the two of them can't use it for obvious reasons. I mean, look at Krillin's height and look at Ten's height. But this could be useful for some other people, because three of the students there are similar in height, and they might even know Pycon in passing. With their training in Otherworld beforehand, I'm sure they would have met him eventually. And now they actually get to know him better over these next few years. And while he's not here, there is another fighter that they're thinking about. They've seen him occasionally since the tournament, but that young fighter Upa is pretty interesting. Uba was motivated by seeing Ten and Krillin's performance in the tournament, albeit a very brief performance. He wants to be as strong as possible, and he saw that those two humans were able to do it, so maybe he can too. As a guardian of Korin's tower, I mean, it's only a matter of time before he climbs up there, meeting Korin and eventually meeting Kami too. And especially with his strength, he can do that relatively easily now. Again, we'll see more of him next time, it's just worth mentioning right now. A few years pass and eventually, a visitor appears on Shin's planet. Someone that Shin knows all too well. It's Beerus, and of course Whis. By this time, Beerus would have awoken, and he'd probably still have his premonition about his Super Saiyan God. And wouldn't you know, apparently Shin has a Saiyan student. Funny enough, they actually do know about Super Saiyan God this time, and they tell Beerus that it's kind of a long way off for Kakarot. They can't do the ritual, but there is another way to get it. As mentioned before, if Kakarot finds a way to access God Key, maybe he can access this form too. Of course, the prospect interests Beerus, and he thinks for a second, and then straight up asks a question. Would Kakarot like to train on his planet? Well, that kind of came out of nowhere. Kakarot's heard of Beerus, but he doesn't know too much about him, and this is the first time he's meeting Beerus. And to be honest, he is a little bit terrified of him. I mean, just listen to his title, God of Destruction. You'd have to be crazy to not be scared of that. Well, at least if you don't know Beerus' true personality. But jokes aside, Kakarot's a bit intimidated, but also intrigued. Before Kakarot goes, though, he wants to test his strength against Beerus. Beerus says he could fight him with all he's got. Any transformations, any techniques, any weapons, he'll allow all of it. Kakarot goes in with a lower level of Kaioken. It does nothing. He goes on with Super Saiyan. It does nothing. He goes on with Super Kaioken. It does nothing. And then he breaks out something interesting. A while ago, he was actually able to pull out the Z-Sword, and that's what he's been training with with Shin. Quickly, he goes to grab it and swings it at Beerus. And instantly, Beerus breaks it, but then realizes what he just did. He glares at Kakarot, 
asking if that was the Z-Sword. Kakarot's terrified too. Oh god, what did he just do? He broke the Z-Sword. But that's not why Beerus is mad. It's because out of the Z-Sword comes Elder Kai. Beerus doesn't want to deal with this right now. So he grabs onto Kakarot and tells him to say goodbye, as he and Whis drag Kakarot away to Beerus' planet, with everyone else just looking on dumbfounded. Both of the fact that Beerus just kidnapped one of Shin's students, the fact that he's even awake, and the fact that there's a new Kai there that they don't know anything about. Elder Kai is equally confused. Who are these three baldies on his planet? And why was Beerus here just now with a Saiyan? They have a lot of questions, but we're gonna have to wait for the next part until they get answered. So, we'll leave off here for now. As discussed last time, once Kakarot left to train with Beerus, it appears that there's a vacancy for Shin and Kibito. They can train someone else now. They already have Ten and Krillin on the planet. But now, Pycon's gonna join too. It's crazy, he's heard of this place and of the Supreme Kai, but he never would have actually expected to be here. What's even crazier is Shin realized that Pycon is actually stronger than Krillin and Ten here, so he's got a head start right away. Not to mention since he's dead, he's kinda advantaged in terms of stamina. So not only does he fit right in, but he hits the ground running. Another interesting point is that Elder Kai is now there, freed from the Z-Sword. These students are actually pretty interesting to him. He's not too involved in the training, but he definitely sees the potential in these three fighters. It gets him thinking, maybe he can help these fighters grow. He does have his own methods, of course, and they seem pretty worthy of it. He continues observing them, wanting to see how they grow to make sure that they actually deserve this. Of course, while this is all happening on the sacred world of Kai's, Kakarot is still with Beerus. His training is going pretty well with Whis. He's already gotten a lot stronger, and it seems he has a grasp on God Ki. But of course his life can't be all training. He does want to take a break once in a while, and asks Whis if he could take him to King Kai's planet. Well, a break might be good for him, so Whis agrees. They're glad to see each other. It's been a while since Kakarot's seen King Kai. I mean, think about it, King Kai's basically his adoptive dad. It's not the usual master-student connection that they had before. Kakarot's excited to show off his new power, and King Kai has something to show too. Out of King Kai's house, somebody walks out. It takes a bit for Kakarot to recognize him, but then he realizes who it is. It's that other student Roshi had, Upa. This is the first time Kakarot formally gets to meet him, besides just seeing him in passing during the Buu Saga. This is definitely a surprise, King Kai has a new student, and it seems Upa moved up here pretty fast. Much like Krillin intended, he worked his way up the realm of gods. And within no time at all, he ended up training with King Kai. His progress has been pretty good. Roshi taught him well, and he seems pretty motivated. Uba's glad to meet Kakarot. He's heard a lot of good things about him, and now he finally gets to actually fight him. Wait, fight him? Yeah, he asked Kakarot if he wants to spar. And I mean, do you think Kakarot's really gonna turn that down? No, he isn't. He's surprised to hear it, but he agrees. Although Kakarot's gonna have to hold back a lot. Right away, they start off in base just to test their power, with Kakarot suppressed. As he uses more power, Uba then goes into Kaioken, using times two. So he's already learned this technique. Kakarot chuckles and does the same, with the two of them controlling it flawlessly. Upa goes into times four, and Kakarot jumps back. All right, he's not gonna play around anymore. He transformed into Super Saiyan. Amazing Upa. Naturally, Upa's kinda disadvantaged. I mean, Kakarot's an alien, while Upa's just a human with no transformations. All he has is the technique Kaioken. While well, Kakarot has access to this, but Upa's not gonna back down. He cranks up Kaioken all the way, to times 20. But even with that, he's disadvantaged, although he continues the fight. Kakarot commences persistence. And Upa asks if this is Kakarot's full power. King Kai knows Kakarot has Super Saiyan Kaioken, but he wonders if this is the extent of Kakarot's power as well. Alright, well just for show, he goes into Super Kaioken, just as King Kai expected. This power is way higher than anything Upa could ever achieve. Although it's a fleeting power, Super Kaioken isn't necessarily easy to handle, he can't use it for long periods of time. But surprisingly to King Kai, Kakarot says that this isn't his limit. Beerus and Whis have been watching the whole time too. This other thing is pretty impressive, but he's no match for Kakarot. Beerus nudges King Kai, saying he's going to want to see this. He, yes, Beerus, helped Kakarot access this new power. Whis butts in saying that he did all the work, but Beerus takes the credit. King Kai's student never ceases to amaze him as he watches Kakarot begin to transform. Kakarot's surrounded by a fiery red aura, as slowly, the shade of his hair begins to change. Unlike the explosive transformation that Super Saiyan is, this one seems a lot more calm. His aura changes, then his hair turns red, with his eyes doing the same. Kakarot introduces this as Super Saiyan God, his newest evolution in power, and his strongest form. It's so weird. Upa can't sense any key coming off him, but he can tell that the presence itself is overwhelming, and King Kai can surely tell that this is a strong form, actually being able to sense it. Upa asks if Kakarot wants to continue the fight, and Kakarot agrees. The both of them know that Upa will lose this, but he just wants to see the extent of Kakarot's power. He lunges at Kakarot with his full speed, shooting past Kaioken times 20 and even going into times 40. He rapidly punches and kicks Kakarot, but he easily dodges everything. Upa continues doing this, not landing a single hit, until Kakarot catches one of his fists. He tells the human that he's impressed, 
he has some great potential and drive. But it's clear that even with that, he's overwhelmed here. With one hit, he knocks Upa out, finishing the fight as the two intended. Kakarot spends some time in the plant, catching up with King Kai and getting to know Upa some more. He's glad that King Kai's found a new student, and King Kai's glad to see how strong Kakarot is now. No matter where he is, Kakarot continues growing, and that puts King Kai at ease. Eventually, Kakarot does head back to Beerus' plant, and everyone resumes their normal training for the time being, until a certain someone comes to Universe 7, that being Shampa. The Universe 6 tournament happens, and as you could guess, the team's gonna be very different this time. The only constant is Kakarot, who isn't even the same as Goku. As for the other four fighters, Krillin, Ten, and Pycon are recruited, with Kakarot deciding to ask Upa if he wants to join too. That makes five fighters, and they're all pretty confident. The tournament itself starts, and Upa's actually the first up, phasing with Tamu. It's so weird because this guy isn't phased by any of his attacks, but Upa realized that this guy is stretchy too. That may have its perks, but it might also be a disadvantage in fighting. Upa grabs onto one of Batamo's arms, and Batamo wonders what he's up to, still unfazed. Upa goes into Kaioken, and with his feet, he creates a key blast, quickly propelling him back to the other side of the ring. As he flies back, Botamo's arm stretches with him. Botamo can't pull his arm back because Upa's just too strong, and instead, this causes him to be slingshotted out of the ring, being defeated in this one swift motion by Upa. Not only is he strong, but he's smart. Although next he faces Frost. In Frost's first form, he's not too much of an issue, but Frost realizes that this guy's taking the fight very seriously. He could just poison him, but instead, Frost decides to transform, not going into his final form, but his assault form. He begins getting the upper hand until Uba activates a new stage of Kaioken. Going into times 20, being able to keep up with him. Frost needs to maintain his demeanor, but he's a bit annoyed. So swiftly, he decides to poison Uba, winning this fight. Next up is Ten Shinha, who forces Frost into his final form due to his power. In terms of strength alone, he outclasses Frost, and Frost realizes that. So once again, he's gonna poison this dude. Ten doesn't notice until it's too late, but with his three eyes, he's able to see the needle right as he stabbed, thinking it was a technique rather than actual poison. He's defeated, but make sure that Frost is disqualified as well. This means him and Upa will get to fight later on. Pycon is up against Mageta next, and of course, Pycon's gonna be able to come up with some insults against Mageta to actually defeat him. That's how he was able to hold off Janemba, so of course, he should be able to do it here too. There's nothing else to cover about this fight. Next up, he faces Kaba, and again, there's nothing really notable here. Pycon would probably take the win, but next he'll be facing Hit, and this kind of is an issue. Pycon actually does have something up his sleeve though, Taking some inspiration from Dragon Ball Heroes, we're actually giving Pycon a new form here, although the form doesn't really change much as far as I can tell. He has a state called Super Pycon, and this is what it looks like in Dragon Ball Heroes. Yeah, there's not really much change. I mean, his clothes are different, but that wouldn't really make sense to change here. The only difference that I could see is the lines on his eyes. So, we don't really know much about it, and it doesn't really change much in terms of features. But hey, him nor Dragon Ball Heroes are canon anyways, so really we could do whatever we want. For simplicity and to help him power up, we're gonna say that this is his equivalent of Super Saiyan. Let's say he gets around a 50 times boost. Hit's actually pretty impressed with this power, and the best part is, since Pycon is still dead, stamina's not an issue for him. However, Hit's time skip is simply too strong. Pycon's disappointed that he's not able to win, because he still had something else that he didn't show off yet. And the next up is Krillin. Krillin also has a new trick up his sleeve. Thanks to Elder Kai, he actually did help power up him, Pycon, and Ten Shinhan. And right from the get-go, Krillin shows this off. There's no physical change, but in terms of power, everyone could tell that he's way stronger. He's surrounded by a white aura, stating that Elder Kai unlocked his potential. This is Ultimate Krillin. Kakarot's amazed to see the power of these two. He definitely needs to spar with them sometime to see how much they've grown. But still, Krillin's not going to take the win here. Hit is able to overcome him and win. Kakarot's actually a bit nervous. Sure, Super Saiyan God's pretty powerful, but Hit, he kind of seems like something else. Immediately, Kakarot goes into God, and he's briefly able to keep up, but Hit takes the advantage once more. Kakarot needs to stay in. He's getting pretty desperate by this point. He is the strongest fighter there, and if he loses, well, Ten and Upa are up next, and they don't stand a chance. While he hasn't really tried this before, he decides to test it out. On top of God, he begins using Kaioken. Although it's not a high level, it's only at a maximum of times four because he's not really sure how to control it. And it's pretty painful to use. But even with this desperate boost in power, it's not enough. Hit takes the win once more. It's the same with Upa, and even though Ten also has ultimate, he can't stand a chance either. Simply put, Hit sweeps Universe 7, causing them to lose. This means Shampa's gonna get the wish, but Beerus isn't gonna let it slide. He doesn't have much time, but he wants to find a way to convince Shampa to do something else. Wait, now that he thinks about it, why does Shampa have to steal Earth? I mean, with the Super Dragon Balls, can't he just copy it or something? Plus, he tells Shampa, Zeno would probably get pretty mad if he's meddling with the universes like that. He wouldn't want to anger Zeno, right? This is a fair point, and Shampa considers it. I mean, stealing Earth is kinda unnecessary, so luckily Shampa hears Beerus out and he's able to be convinced. 
He makes the more reasonable choice of asking for a copy of Earth, rather than just stealing it from Beerus and being an ass about it. Crisis averted. So everything's back to normal, right? Everything's all good. Well, not quite. Things may be settled now, but of course it's not gonna stay like that. Following this arc, we'd normally have Zamasu, but that's not gonna happen here. There is no time traveler to anger Zamasu, and sure, seeing Kakarot's power may sour him a bit, but I mean, it's nothing to kill every mortal in the universe over. Zamasu just doesn't have the same motivation here to actually do what he wants. There's nothing that really ticks him off enough to send him in that direction. So luckily, that arc gets completely avoided, but one arc that won't be avoided is the Tournament of Power. Zeno saw this tournament and actually visited, deciding that it was pretty fun and he wanted to do something like that for himself. He's probably not gonna form the same friendship with Kakarot here. Kakarot isn't Goku, as we've discussed many times in the scenario. He's much more respectful of the gods, and actually pretty fearful of Zeno once he hears who he is. But now he needs to find 10 fighters for the tournament, and that's gonna be pretty tough. At first, it's not so bad. The same people from the Universe 6 tournament are recruited, Ten, Krillin, Upa, and Pycon. The first three of them actually suggest Roshi should be recruited too. He is pretty strong despite his age, and he'd probably be willing to fight alongside his three students. They ask, and he does join, much to Kakarot's surprise. He knows that Roshi trained the three of them, but he's never actually seen Roshi's power. This'll be an interesting thing to see. Kakarot begins thinking, trying to find planets where he could find fighters on. That shouldn't be an issue though. He spent so much time with King Kai that he knows universal geography pretty well. Is geography even the right word for that? I, I don't know, I'm not an astronomer. Anyways, he knows his galaxy and some of the universe pretty well. For one, he knows Namek has some pretty strong fighters, so he decides to check that planet. The Earthlings are pretty amazed to see Namek. They didn't even know until now that this is where King Piccolo and Kami came from, or at least the person who used to be the two combined. The Namekian tear of this torment and realize that it's pretty dire. They reveal that they could all fuse together and help that way. And they see Pycon wondering if he's a Namekian too, kinda racist. But they see he doesn't have the nose, ears, or the antenna. So he's just a random green guy. Jokes aside though, they can fuse together. They just need to know how many fighters Universe 7 needs. So, Kakarot and everyone will come back later to see them. Another good place to check is Yardrat. The people here aren't very strong, but in terms of technique, they make up for that. Naturally, the best person to recruit would be Paibara. And although he's hesitant, he decides to join because it's for the sake of the universe. They tell him they actually have Namekians joining who are gonna fuse together, but they don't wanna use all their Namekians because they're worried. If they're all fused together, they can't defuse. It turns out they're in good hands because Paibara can defuse them. How convenient. So, they go to Namek and tell everyone this. The Namekians can fuse together without worry. After the tournament, they'll be defused, returning the planet back to normal. And because of that, they decide it's probably best that everyone fuses into one Namekian, just so they have as much power as they could possibly get. As of now, the strongest person there is a Namekian named Nail, and he agrees to be the host. The Namekians begin fusing together, fusing into him. It's gonna be a long process because there's a lot of people to fuse, so they'll give the Namekian some time. Okay, things are going good so far. They have Kakarot plus the original five people that he recruited. Now Paibara and Nail are joining too. That makes eight. Kakarot racks his brain trying to think of some other fighters. On Earth, there's not really anyone too strong. I mean, there is Kami, but they'd be better off fusing him into Nail, which they're hesitant about because they're not sure how it'll affect Earth, and since it would be a lot to throw at Kami at once. Kakarot does remember one person, there was someone who isn't particularly strong and wasn't particularly a good person either. Some emperor named Frieza. He explains to everyone, this guy's a tyrant, the most wicked of the wicked. He's actually the person who destroyed his planet. However, the group votes against it. They don't want an evil person joining them, especially considering he might not even be that strong. But it's good that they know about Frieza. They could be concerned about him for later, but he'd be a bad pick. They'd be better off just reviving Boo purposefully. Well, there is Master Shen, but Ten decides it might be a good idea to recruit Chaozu. He's not particularly strong and he hasn't been training with Ten that much. He's only seen Ten when he's been on Earth. But he's an old friend who does have some good techniques at least. And that's the only other strong Earthling that they can think of. But even then, that only makes nine fighters. Kakarot, Ten, Krillin, Roshi, Pycon, Paibara, Nail, Upa, and now Chaozu. It's up to Kakarot to find someone else strong in the universe. There has to be someone. Kakarot goes back to Whis. Maybe he can help. They gotta survey the universe. There has to be someone. Thankfully, Whis is able to help, but it's gonna take some time to search the whole universe. He pulls out his staff and they begin looking. It seems they already have most of the strong people. Kakarot's hoping that maybe they have people like Universe 6 did, maybe their own version of Hit. He knows they have their own version of Frost, but he's not particularly a good pick. And in terms of someone like Kaba, or Kakarot for that regard, well, Kakarot's the only Saiyan that's living, right? And this is where things get weird. Something catches Whis' eye that he didn't expect. Whis turns to Kakarot and actually has some good news, and also possibly some bad news to go along with it. The good news is, Whis did find someone who may be particularly strong and may be able to help. But the bad news is, well, Kakarot's not the only Saiyan left in the universe. This other strong fighter is also a Saiyan as well. And maybe the whole reason he survived is because he was banished to this planet. This of course comes as a shock to Kakarot. He thought he was the only one left. 
but Whis pulls out his staff. There's two left. One's an old Saiyan, not particularly helpful, but the other, named Broly, may actually be of use. Kakarot doesn't know what to think of this. There's two other Saiyans this whole time and he didn't know. And even if the Saiyan is strong, time's running out. He's not sure if he'll be able to convince him to join the tournament. Right away, Shen teleports Kakarot away. They need to make haste and hopefully they can convince this guy. With that, we'll enough this part here for now. After Shin arrives on Beerus' planet, he and Kakarot teleport straight to Vampa. Shin's a little bit nervous, but Kakarot says it'll be okay. He knows how to talk to people and hopefully he can convince this guy to get on the team. Shin waits nearby as Kakarot goes over. Seeing a man carrying a giant dead bug, he flies over and casually greets the man. It's Broly, and he's immediately on guard. No one else is supposed to be on this planet. Kakarot doesn't seem too intimidating, but obviously this would be suspicious. Paragus hears and comes out too. And now Kakarot has a lot of explaining to do. He knows they don't know each other, but tells them they have a common goal. The universe is at risk, and he hopes that Broly can help them save it. He goes into a lot more detail, explaining who he is and what's going on, and why they should trust him. Even with all this explanation, of course the two of them would still be suspicious. Although, how else does this guy get here and know about them? He might actually be credible. But Paragus notes something. He has a tail. Is he a Saiyan too? He's dressed very weird for a Saiyan, and Kakarot goes into more detail. This puts Paragus more at ease. He thought he was just another normal Saiyan, but really, Kakarot's completely different. He's only a Saiyan by blood. Kakarot doesn't really know how to entice the two, but he tells them that he can get them off this planet if they help. From what he knows, Broly's pretty strong and seems to have a lot of potential. But Paragus has one more question. If this guy knows about other Saiyans existing in the universe, does he know if one named Vegeta is still alive? Kakarot tells him that he was responsible for Vegeta's death. He was a bad guy who attacked Earth, and Kakarot helped stop it, with some help from his friend Krillin. This puts Paragus more at ease. Not only is Vegeta dead, but this guy killed him. Maybe the two can get along. Plus, he and Broly get off this hellish planet. All they need is for Broly to join the tournament. Although, Broly isn't really prepared. Sure, he has fighting experience and is strong, but he's gonna need a little bit more training. No worries though, Kakarot has the perfect plan. Back on Earth, he takes Broly into the Room of Spirit and Time, along with another fighter. Nail has now arrived on Earth, with every Namekian fused within him. Since they only needed one extra fighter, they didn't need two fused Namekians, only one which makes Nail way stronger than he would be. He has every single Namekian fuse within him at the moment, and Kakarot wants to test his power. Nail actually may be the strongest on the team now, and the best part is he can come in the room of spirit and time without taking any of the food, so they won't have to worry about rationing anything. It's not like they have that much time anyways. The three enter, ready to train for a few months. As you'd probably expect, Nail is pretty strong and Kakarot's impressed, as well as with Broly's strength too. Broly doesn't have any real experience besides fighting those monsters on Vampa, but slowly and surely he begins to adapt, especially with Kakarot and Nail's training. Nail notices something interesting with Kakarot. The two try and test each other's powers out while fighting. Kakarot specifically wants to test something out. Taking Whis's teachings into mind, he calms himself, ready for Nail to attack. Nail begins attacking. In terms of strength, the two are pretty even, but Kakarot's going for something else. He dodges Nail's attacks, wanting to see if his body can react automatically. Broly watches on as well, interested to see what's happening. This isn't really out of the ordinary for them. Remember, they don't really know Kakarot too well. But Kakarot's clearly going for a higher power. He even closes his eyes as Nail fights, with Nail sort of getting an idea of what he's trying to do. Nail focuses more and powers up further, with Kakarot's body continuing to somewhat react on its own. For a brief second, it seems like his aura warps becoming more purplish. But just as it does, Nail lands a hit right at Kakarot's face, knocking him back right into Super Saiyan Blue again. Kakarot knows he's making some progress, so he continues going for this. A few days before their training's up in the time chamber, surprisingly the door opens and someone bursts in. It's Elder Kai. He can't believe he forgot. He tells them he wants to unlock someone's potential. They wish they knew before because then they can unlock everyone's potential, but now he only has time to really do one or maybe two people. Kakarot can't believe that slipped his mind, but it doesn't matter. He tells him to unlock Nail's potential and Broly's potential. Obviously he's pursuing his own power, and he feels that Nail and Broly will benefit the most from it. And as you'd expect, they will. Broly doesn't have access to any forms yet. And after Kakarot hears about how he rages out at times, yeah, it's probably better that he doesn't try and transform into Super Saiyan or something. Him getting ultimate would really help. As for Nail, he doesn't have any transformations at all. He's just really strong as is. Getting ultimate will only make it more potent. So, Elder Kai unlocks their potentials, wishing that he could do the same for Kakarot, but there's no time. The three exit the room of spirit and time, and immediately, Whis takes everyone towards the tournament. All the humans are ready, as is Pycon and Pybara. They're teleported to the world of Void ready for the tournament to begin. At the very start, Pybara begins by multiplying himself, not as a way to fight, but as a way to persevere. One of his clones gets really small, enough to hide in one of the cracks of the rocks nearby once it's opened. He does this with a few other clones. His main body is hidden, while the other one that's actually fighting is a distraction. Of course, in terms of strength, he's not too strong, 
but he'll focus on support, using spirit fission and instant transmission to avoid being attacked. Occasionally, he taps random fighters to steal some energy, gathering some as the tournament goes on. One of the first fights is Chaozu vs. Universe 9, specifically the trio of danger. Ten is confident that he can take them all on, he just needs Chaozu's help. Chaozu begins by trying to stun Lavender, who seems to be one of the biggest problems. Ten avoids the poison, and with Lavender stunned, he's able to knock him out, leaving Ten only facing two of them. Basil isn't too hard for him to fight. His strength is pretty impressive at this point, way better than what Basil is at. Once again, Chaozu is able to support him by stunning Basil. But Bergamo quickly sees what's going on. Once Basil is knocked out, Bergamo goes right for Chaozu. Luckily, he's the last one left, so that makes it easier for Ten to defend against him. With Ultimate, he's able to handily take out Bergamo, defeating the trio of danger thanks to his help from Chaozu. Even though Chaozu's strength isn't that great, he was a good help. Having a fighter to support him was really good. The rest of the fighters are able to hold their own pretty well. Broly is a lot more experienced now and stronger. He didn't have much time to get used to Ultimate, so he doesn't really know his own strength, but slowly he learns. Nail has a much easier time though. He was already strong before and Ultimate only makes him that much stronger. He's definitely the strongest at this moment, at least for Universe 7. One of the interesting things that he notices is that Universe 6 has Namekians as well, and they seem to have a similar story to him. These two also fuse with their entire planet, although instead of one fighter, it's two. It seems they have a lot in common, with them having a mutual respect for each other. This is one of Nail's first fights, and as you'd probably expect, he is able to win here. He doesn't particularly care about a wish, he's not gonna get anything selfish, but he says that if he does, he'd prefer to revive the universes. They don't deserve erasure, neither does Universe 7. All of them are equal in his eyes. Seeing those two Namekians further proves it. They're all in the same situation. And Nail's not really the only one to share that idea. Upa and Roshi are also fighting together. This is one of Upa's first real fights, at least on this scale. He's had a lot of fights on Earth, but this is very different. But he can finally put his training to use. Roshi definitely still has some things to teach him, as does Kami and King Kai. But in terms of strength, he's far surpassed his masters by now, showing that off against some fighters from Universe 2, with a combination of skill and power. Krillin even joins in the fight trying to help them, Surprised to see how strong the newest student of the Turtle School is. As for Pycon, he would either work with Ten and Chaozu or would go alone. He makes great use of his new super form, showing off some awesome power. A lot of the universes are taken aback. Universe 7 is pretty strong, and it's not just one fighter, it's multiple. Nail, Broly, Pycon, and of course Kakarot, they're all really strong. And the humans shouldn't be underestimated either. Even the two weakest fighters, Chaozu and Paibara, they have a lot of great techniques up their sleeve. In all honesty, I'd say Team Universe 7 is better off here than it was in canon, despite how radically different it is. Speaking of Kakarot, he begins testing out something brand new. He's done Super Kaioken before, and he has Super Saiyan Blue, so why not try Blue Kaioken? This is another big difference between him and Goku. He still hasn't really tried Blue Kaioken in a fight yet, although it's great for short bursts of power here and there. He knows he could break his limits, but he's not sure how. Blue Kaioken is strong and all, but he knows there's something more, something that Whis was trying to teach him a power that he felt when he was training with Broly and Nail. A good way to test this would be to fight Jiren, pushing his limits to the max. Also, Jiren does seem like a big threat. Kakarot aims to take him out right away. He has a much different demeanor than Goku would have. But still, his Saiyan blood is pumping and he does look forward to a great fight against Jiren. This eventually leads to Kakarot making a spirit bomb, which surprisingly, he's never really used before. It's great because he's finally able to test out this trump card that King Kai gave him. And what's better, he has some perfect supports for it. Everyone on this team is pretty strong granting him a lot of energy, and as for Paibara, he's gathered some from other fighters from other universes, which makes the Spirit Bomb much more potent than it was in canon. And though Kakarot hasn't really used Blue Kaioken too much, remember, in this scenario he's focused a lot more on Kaioken, so it's likely that he'd get the hang of this a lot faster. We saw Goku was worried about using it because he might die if he did it wrong, but that's not too big of an issue here. He uses it when pushing the Spirit Bomb back. Of course, he faces a lot of resistance from Jiren, but the bomb itself is a lot stronger too. Jiren is actually forced to put some more pressure in, and Kakarot's able to push it closer and closer to him. However, at the last moment, Jiren lets out a burst of power. The spirit bomb grazes him, but just as it does, he shouts as he pushes it back with more power. Kakarot falls into the spirit bomb, seemingly dying from the attack. But luckily, this actually helps him. It's more so a catalyst than anything. He's able to survive, not only doing that, but channeling all the energy of the bomb within him, using it basically as fuel, trying to resist in whatever way possible. So not only does he unlock Ultra Instinct like normal, but he actually has a better grasp on it. He almost saw it before, in the time chamber. This acted as a way to make him obtain it. But also the Spirit Bomb kind of fueled him in a way, making it so he's not that worn out like he was normally. Rather than this power being fleeting, he has a much better grasp on it. Without even thinking, he immediately goes for Jiren. And Jiren's actually surprised at the power increase. Kakarot was strong before, but this is something completely different. 
The two begin clashing as Kakarot actually gets the upper hand. He knows that Jiren is hiding more power. Jiren's a big threat and Kakarot wants to end this quickly. He does enjoy the fight though, but it's gonna have to be cut short. Kakarot ramps up his power as Jiren tries to do the same, with Kakarot dodging every attack, even countering some of them. Slowly, he pushes Jiren towards the edge. Jiren throws a punch as Kakarot grabs his arm, pushing it past him as he gets behind Jiren, kicking the back of his legs. Jiren loses balance and is about to fall on his back, and before he does, Kakarot lands a powerful kick, flinging Jiren off the side. Jiren tries to maneuver his way back in the ring, but Kakarot launches a massive key blast, pushing Jiren farther away until he falls into the void. With this, Jiren is defeated. Although there's one downside, Kakarot is basically out of commission. Even though he had a better grasp on UI and had some fuel for it, the power itself is still very taxing on his body. He gives out, and Paibara considers healing him, but he knows that he won't have enough for Kakarot. He just gives enough to make sure that he's okay. But Kakarot isn't able to use his power for the rest of the tournament. Luckily, the other fighters got this. Inevitably, at some point, Kale and Cauliflower would fuse into Kefla. But there's two really big issues for them here. For one, Kaba never learned Super Saiyan. By this point, he probably wouldn't know what it is after seeing Kakarot use it. But he wouldn't know how to access it at all, or even if he can. And because of that, Kale and Cauliflower most likely don't know it either. So when they fuse into Kefla, Kefla's just in her base form. She still is decently strong, but Pycon takes her on. And he's actually a pretty great match for her, even overpowering the fusion. Paibara offers to defuse them but Pycon likes the challenge. He's able to face her alone, defeating the fusion, showing off some more of his great power. Nail fights against the Universe 11 fighters, eventually facing Topo. The humans take on Dispo, and Dispo's able to actually knock some of them out due to his speed. But once Pycon defeats Kefla, he comes in to help. Dispo is defeated as Nail continues to face Topo. Topo never abandons his morals and goes into the God of Destruction mode, which actually helps Nail come out on top. No pun intended. Besides that, the only other big threat left is Aniraza who tries to go for Kakarot and defeat him, seeing him as a potential threat even though he seems worn out right now. But Kakarot watches on as his friends defend him. All of Universe 7 bands together to defeat the giant monster. Kakarot summons the last of his strength and stands up as well, going into Super Saiyan. All of the remaining fighters defeat Aniraza together, showing off the true combined strength of Universe 7. And with that, they win the Tournament of Power. In terms of an MVP, there are a few candidates. Paibara did help a lot in terms of support. Paikon and Nail also got some great eliminations on their own. And obviously Kakarot did pretty well too. Although really his only big elimination was Jiren. So I feel like Nail would probably get the honor. He helped out his group a lot and got some pretty important eliminations. He has both quantity and quality to his name. Meaning he gets the wish from the Super Dragon Balls. As we know, he wants to wish for the other universes to be restored. He was planning this from the start and hoped that whoever won would wish for that. And thankfully he's the one to get that wish. He looks at Super Shenron with one wish in mind restore every universe that was erased. He's never seen a dragon quite like this. This is way more intimidating than Parunga. Everyone's pretty happy to hear this, especially Zeno and the Grand Priest. All the universes are restored, and everything's returned back to normal. Although this poses a weird question, Nail said he was going to get defused by Paibara, and he does end up doing that, but Nail got the ultimate form. And once all the Namekians are defused out of him, he's likely going to keep that. But when you think about it, does it mean that the other Namekians have ultimate as well? I don't know. Imagine a whole planet of people with the ultimate form. It would definitely boost Namek's power. I'll let you guys come up with an answer for that hypothetical question. Anyways, we head back to Earth. Broly and Paragus would likely stay there. King Kai's planet doesn't have much space, and there's no real reason for them to be on the sacred world of Kai's or Beerus' planet. But the Earthlings welcome both of them. Which is nice. They finally got off of Vampa and have a new home. And Broly's finally got a grasp on his power. Well, hopefully. We still haven't really seen his rage yet. Instead of working to perfect that, Kakarot somewhat ignored it. He saw brief flare-ups of it in the time chamber, but they've never seen Broly's true wrath. Hopefully they won't have to deal with it later on. But of course, things aren't going to be entirely peaceful. Now that we've finished the Tournament of Power, the next logical step is going into the Moro arc. This arc will be the conclusion of the series. So after the Tournament of Power, of course the Broly movie is supposed to happen, but here, there is no Broly movie. The explanation's pretty obvious. Broly's already part of the story. By now he's actually moved to Earth. Thankfully, nothing happens the same way it did in the movie. He gets to avoid getting beat up, and Paragus gets to live. There's no Frieza Force, no Chi Lai and Lemo, and obviously no Gogeta. And with Broly on Earth, that is going to change some things. You'll see later. As for the Namekians, by now they've all defused. In the last part, I left off with a question. It was kind of a joke, but after thinking some more, I realized that it would actually really change the outcome of this arc. I was asking whether or not the Namekians would all keep Ultimate. Remember, Nail got it while he was fused, and I was wondering if maybe they can all keep it once they defused. And after reading through the comments and deciding for myself, 
I was thinking maybe it would be better if Nail's the only one to keep it. It would make sense for only him to keep it after all. Only his latent power was unlocked, not really the other Namekians individually. They may get a passive boost from this, but they wouldn't have the same boost as Nail does. And you might be thinking, what's the point of this distinction? Well, it's actually pretty important because if you consider it, every Namekian having ultimate would basically nullify this arc and make it not happen. There would be two outcomes. One, Moro would go to Namek and get absolutely devastated by all the Namekians there. Or two, Moro would steal all of their power and become unstoppable, leading to the destruction of the universe most likely. So instead, I feel it might be more interesting to have them not get ultimate. But Nail gets lucky and he keeps it. Anyways, the arc begins as you'd expect. Moro escapes prison and decides to make a beeline for Namek. The Galactic Patrol is scrambling to handle him. Of course, there's no Boo to help them. And they're not too aware of any good fighters on Earth. Well, they know there are some, but a lot of them are gone by now. They don't know much about Broly, and while Roshi and Upa are strong, they're not strong enough to do anything against Moro, and the Galactic Patrol probably wouldn't know too much about them either. All the other strong fighters are off-planet and have been off-planet for a while, as discussed in the last few parts. When Moro's coming to Namek, all the Namekians actually sense him coming. Quickly, they try and formulate a plan. They think the Dragon Balls may be at risk, so right away, a lot of the Namekians help hide them, while the strong warrior Namekians, including Nail, all get ready to fight. The Galactic Patrol is also trying to pursue Moro, so while the Namekians prepare for him to arrive, they can sense that the Galactic Patrol is soon going to come and try and help them. Nail takes charge. Kind of like we saw in the manga, a lot of the warrior Namekians would probably want to fuse. That gives them the best shot at fighting Moro. And here, the Namekian savior would be Nail. They've already all fused into him before, so it's kind of routine by now. Not to mention he'd be much stronger than the Namekian savior we saw in the manga. Although it's not every Namekian fusing into him, so he's not as strong as his tournament of power counterpart. But even if he's only half as strong, he's still way stronger than pretty much any fighter. He may actually have a shot against Moro. This becomes apparent once Moro actually gets onto the planet. The sole person ready to fight him is Nail himself. Moro doesn't really expect much of this Namekian. Sure, he knows some Namekians may be strong, but this one, he doesn't really seem like too much trouble, especially because it's only one of them. He quickly learns that that's not the case. Nail immediately attacks with extreme prejudice, ready to defeat him right away. Moro actually gets a bit injured by this, caught off guard by a couple punches from Nail. He's actually pretty surprised. He would have never expected a Namekian to be this strong, but there may be upsides to this too. Using energy absorption, he could benefit from this. He starts to take energy from the planet and Nail, not killing Nail because he may have information about the Dragon Balls. Right now, he just wants Nail out of the picture and to get a nice snack out of him. He plans to keep the Namekian alive. And while the Galactic Patrol hasn't contacted anyone, someone is watching this. After the Tournament of Power, Shin knows that the mortal level of his universe is pretty low, so he starts to pay more attention. This would most likely catch his eye. Not only is Namek under attack, but the person that's attacking actually seems pretty threatening. And something about the guy attacking seems pretty familiar. Shin doesn't know too much about Moro, but he knows that he's heard of him from the Grand Supreme Kai before. Although since it was so long ago, he's only heard stories. But from what he can gather, this guy is a pretty strong magician that could take people's energy. And while Nail may be pretty strong, Namek's gonna need some help. Luckily, Shin has some people on his planet that could help right away. Currently training with him, he has Krillin, Pykon, and Shinhan. And while the magic may be an issue, Shin has a plan. Using his magic abilities, he may be able to work around it, at least providing support for the fighters. The fighters agree to go, and immediately they teleport over to Namek. They're not too sure how they're going to defeat him. Maybe these three fighters and Nail can help rough him up a bit, and then the Galactic Patrol can take care of him. But Shin remembers the Grand Supreme Kai said something about sealing him away. Maybe Shin could figure out a way to do that himself. If so, that would be the simple solution, but he's not too sure how yet. He's going to keep that in mind, though. Now Moro is outnumbered and overpowered, pretty greatly overpowered too. But he sees someone that catches his eye. The Supreme Kai is there. Of course, now with Shin there, he'd probably be Moro's main target. But luckily, the fighters are all able to hold him off. He tries to steal their energy, but then he notices something. He still can steal energy, but it's not as potent as it was before. Shin doesn't really know how to do it perfectly yet, but he's able to try and counter Moro's magic. Again, it's not something perfect, but it's enough to try and mitigate it at least a bit. If he does this long enough, then maybe the fighters can kill Moro. But the evil magician is much smarter than that. He realizes their plan and knows that he's going to have to work around it somehow. And really, the only way to do it is actually to retreat. They're beating Moro pretty badly, and luckily for him, he has an escape. He lifts his hands up, launching lava out from the ground below him. And as the lava clears, the fighters see multiple Moros flying away. There's at least a dozen of them, and no one knows which one is the real Moro. Moro and his apparitions all fly away, with the fighters wondering who they should chase down. Pycon quickly charges up an attack and launches it towards the Moros. But when it connects, all of them disappear. None of them were real. The real Moro actually escaped elsewhere, keeping a low profile and running away instead of flying away. It's clear that they may need some more help. 
Luckily, someone else was watching over, and someone tries to contact Shin. All the way on Beerus' planet, Kakarot is actually aware of what's happening, but Beerus and Whis waited to send him. They didn't want him to get involved right away, but now that things are getting kind of bad, they say that it may be a good idea. He asks Shin to teleport him there. He thinks he has a great idea of how to counter Moro. Shin immediately goes there, picking up Kakarot and going back to Namek with him. Kakarot's idea is pretty simple. He asks everyone if they remember that technique he had in the Tournament of Power, Ultra Instinct. Well, actually, he's trying to work on that now, and it might be effective against Moro, as well as letting Kakarot test his power. They definitely remember it from before, but they're surprised. Can he even access that? He shows it off. After training with Beerus and Wheat some more, he actually figured out how to access it at will. We even saw this before the Tournament of Power. When he was in the Room of Spirit and Time, he was really close to figuring out how to use it whenever. The Tournament of Power just gave him a bigger push as to how it feels. Combined with all his knowledge and experience, he can actually use UI Omen whenever he wants. It's still a bit draining, but the fact that he can use it at will is pretty helpful. But Nail Sunta is something terrible. All the Namekians are in trouble. They hid the Dragon Balls, but somehow, Moro was able to find them all. He was able to quickly get some in his possession. And now that he's close to getting the final ones, they could actually sense him moving quickly. He's definitely trying to make haste. But by the time they all catch up to him, it's too late. Paranga's in the sky, and he already granted one of the wishes. Moro turns around grinning. Now with a new look, his beard has shrunk, his wrinkles have gone away, and he's gotten slightly more muscular, not to mention his powers increased greatly. His former power has been restored. But even with this, Kakarot isn't deterred. He tells everyone to try and protect the Namekians, as Kakarot tells Shin to follow him. Moro is surprised. He hasn't seen this fighter before. He wonders what this guy's plan is, until he sees Ultra Instinct. Ah, a technique of the gods. This may be a worthy opponent, but even with that, Moro feels that he still has the upper hand. But with Shin there to help Kakarot, they definitely have the upper hand right now. Immediately, he begins attacking Moro. The gap in power is clear. Despite Moro's new power-up, Kakarot still has the upper hand. Not just defensively, but offensively too. Plus, Shin's magic mitigates some of Moro's. Not just his energy absorption, but pretty much all his other abilities. Not that it completely nullifies it, but it's weakened enough to make a difference. Moro's pissed off now, but luckily help is coming in soon. Kakarot continues fighting undeterred. And just as he's about to finish off Moro, there's a distraction. A ship flies in, and Moro chuckles as he mentions that he had another wish. All the Galactic Patrol prisoners have escaped. And once again, Moro lifts a hand up as lava flies out of the ground, almost hitting Kakarot, but he dodges it, flipping backwards as he's surrounded by plumes of lava. The plumes go away, and he sees Moro standing on the ship, commanding all the prisoners to attack. Even with this threat, the fighters are determined. Krill and Tenshinhan and Pycon are all really strong. Of course, Nail's pretty strong, too. Together with Kakarot, they're able to fight off a lot of the prisoners. Shin even gets involved in the fighting too, focusing on them, but they lose focus on Moro. And now with Shin under attack, he doesn't have to worry about his magic being mitigated. Moro begins taking their energy more and more. They power down during battle, slowly losing all their energy. They've already defeated some of the prisoners and helped the Galactic Patrol catch some. But if it keeps going like this, they're not going to win. Quickly, Shin teleports around grabbing onto everyone. Not just the fighters there, but also locating the remaining Namekians. They teleport out of there, landing on the sacred world of Kai as the Galactic Patrol also scrambles to escape. Nail says that he has an idea. He could try and fuse with the remaining Namekians, and that could make him stronger. He thinks that maybe fusing with more will really help, and he's not too worried. Pybara can help defuse him later. Krillin perks up when he hears this. Wait, that's actually an amazing idea. Nail thinks so too, as does everyone else. But Krillin says he's not talking about that. He's talking about Pybara. Maybe he could help. He remembers that the Yard Rats actually have some weird ability to take people's energy, just like how they're able to defuse Nail. Maybe they can consult him for help. Kakarot actually picks up on this too and realizes that it might work. He decides he's gonna go ask him, so Shin takes him to Yardrat. Paibara welcomes Kakarot. It's been a bit of time since he's seen him. He wonders, is the universe at risk again from a tournament? Well, it's at risk again, but not from that. Kakarot explains the situation, and Paibara understands. He's willing to help, although he personally can't go there and risk his life. If he tried to fight Moro and steal his energy, there'd be no way that could work. But he does have another idea. He'd be willing to teach it to Kakarot. Kakarot's surprised. He didn't even realize he could learn something like this. Well, yeah, if that's the way it works, he's down to do that. Things are seeming to get better. Since Kakarot's pretty strong right now, he's probably the best bet to actually get this. Shin considers bringing the other fighters here, but it's better for Kakarot to just have himself there as the only focus for Paibara. Shin has a separate plan. He's gonna go back to his planet and train the fighters there, trying to teach them magic. Sure, he might not be the best at magic like the Grand Supreme Kai, but this limited knowledge in it may be enough. If he teaches some magic to the other fighters, at the very least they can try and mitigate the effects of Moro like he did. Plus, it's a new route of power for them. It'll let them get stronger in a different way. As Kakarot begins his training, Shin teleports back to his planet. 
This is going to take some time though, and in that time, Moro begins going around the universe, mainly with his scouts going to find treasure. Of course, one of the big targets would be Earth. One day, Oop is training with King Kai, and King Kai notes that he senses something terrible heading towards Earth. Immediately, Oop goes to return, flying across Snake Way in a matter of seconds, quickly meeting up with Kami who teleports him back to Earth. Roshi's already at the lookout, he sensed this too, and even Chaozu came along. The three of them are ready to defend Earth. Moro scouts arrive, and right away Upa goes into Kyle Ken, and the three fighters go into battle. While Chaozu and Roshi aren't the strongest fighters, they are really helpful here, and Upa is pretty strong in his own right, especially with Kyle Ken now. As they are now, they're probably enough to actually defend Earth, defeating the scouts that came there, at least the first wave of them. These aren't the last of the scouts, the three of them are still on guard, and in a matter of days, more scouts show up with some stronger than the rest. One of them is actually the leader of the crew, Saganba. The three humans have a tough time fighting him, but luckily, they have another ally that comes in quickly. Broly joins it on the fight. After those other scouts showed up, they would be stupid to not contact him, and he's glad to help. It's been a while since he's had a real fight too, so this is some great practice. Immediately, the Saiyan clashes with Saganba, having a clear upper hand. He makes quick work of the escaped prisoner, and tells him to consider this a message, don't have any more of them come to Earth. Saganbo's angered, but then goes to leave. But before he does, he tries to launch one last attack at Broly. But together, the other three fighters jump in with him. Since there's not much else to do on Earth, they actually all train with Roshi for a bit. Obviously, Upa already has. But Chaozu and Broly are relatively new students for him. Or at least honorary students. And they showcase their combined might against Saganbo. Quickly, the four of them all make the same pose. Charging a Kamehameha, launching it towards the escaped prisoner. Who's then easily killed by the blast. They successfully defended Earth, and Moro considers going after Earth himself, but he decides it's not worth bothering yet. Scouts can focus on the other planets for now. He's already lost a couple scouts from that planet, and it wouldn't really be worth it for him to go himself and try and take their energy. The fighters there aren't incredibly strong, and Earth is a little bit out of the way for him. He'll get to it later, so luckily for now, Earth is safe and off of Moro's radar, but he'll keep it in mind. Moro right now is trying to eat other planets and find Kakarot once more. Kakarot seems like the best source of energy. Eventually, this would lead to some of his scouts getting to Yardrat. Of course, Kakarot would defeat them pretty easily, but this would mean word spreads to Moro that he's there. And Kakarot realizes that immediately, he needs to leave. He thanks Paibara for his training. By now, it's been about a month or so since he got there, and Kakarot's a pretty fast learner. He's gotten stronger thanks to spirit control, but also has some new techniques. He waves bye to Paibara, saying that now is the time for him to end this. Plus, it gives him the opportunity to test out another technique. He places two fingers on his forehead, locating Shin's energy. He finds it, and then using his new technique of instant transmission, he teleports to the sacred world of Kai. He tells them all that it's now the time to attack, asking Shin if he could take the other fighters to Moro. Shin says he'll come along too, but he can't do too much. If he dies, then Beerus would die, but he'll still be there as a support. He's just not going to be one of the main fighters. But the other three have gotten much stronger, not just from their training, but also learning limited magic. Kakarot wants them to hold off Moro as he goes to clean up the other planets, and he wishes them luck as he teleports away. Immediately, Kakarot begins going around the universe, going to any planets where he senses trouble. This is really simple for him, he moves so quick with his transmission, and with single attacks, he's able to wipe out all of Moro's scouts, hopping from planet to planet while doing so. And before he goes to join the humans and Pycon once more, he has to make one last stop. He teleports to King Kai's planet. He wants to make sure that King Kai's okay and he says that he is, saying that Upa even went to defend Earth. King Kai's been monitoring the situation, seeing what's been going on, and he's gotta say, he's pretty proud of Kakarot. Kakarot has spent a lot of time on Beerus' planet, but the two have seen each other in between, and King Kai does know of his progress. I mean, of course they would keep up to date with each other. Kakarot is basically his adoptive son, as well as his first and best student. Kakarot tells him that he's gonna finish this, with King Kai wishing him luck. But he tells Kakarot, no matter what abilities he learns, whether it's Ultra Instinct or Spirit Vision, there is still one thing he needs to learn from King Kai being a better comedian. Kakarot promises to brush up on his comedy, but first, he's gonna have to protect the universe once more, thanking King Kai as he teleports away. Out on a remote planet, the humans in Pycon are fighting a lot of the prisoners. It's not too hard to fight them. Shin's students are much stronger, but as they thin out the herd, one fighter stands out, named 7-3. But just before he attacks, Kakarot comes in, ready to fight him. Immediately, he has the upper hand, then jumping into Super Saiyan God. 7-3 is confused, he didn't expect someone this strong, so instead he tries to reach for Kakarot's neck. Kakarot doesn't know what he's planning, so he dodges it, doing so with ease. 7-3 keeps trying to steal his power, but Kakarot won't let him. He knows this guy might be trouble, so quickly he ends it. With one attack, he kills the android. And now with 7-3 defeated, most of Moro's crew is gone, at least a lot of the strong ones. 
it's now his time to fight. He's angered, but not too much. He begins taking energy from the planet below him, also trying to steal some from the fighters. But as he tries to take energy from the fighters, something weird happens. It stops midway, as he gets into a tug of war with them. He's then kicked square in the face by Kakarot, who's now an Ultra Instinct Omen once more, as all the fighters pull the energy back into them. They learn just enough magic to help prevent this, and magic's pretty cool, they definitely want to learn more of it. I just realized that that's kind of an accidental pun. More of it, more of it, nah you know what, ignore that, that's kind of stupid. Anyways, Kakarot is now the main opponent for Moro, and once again he has the upper hand, not only being much stronger, but also, Moro has less of his magic to utilize. Easily, Kakarot is dodging all of his attacks, as well as hitting Moro too. He begins wearing the Magician down, and Moro realizes that things are getting bad for him. Kakarot's worried that this guy's gonna get desperate, doing something really destructive, so he'll end this right now. He reveals Spirit Vision. He begins taking Moro's energy, not only returning it to all the planets where it was stolen from, but stealing so much that the Magician actually gets weaker. He keeps trying to attack, but as he gets weaker, he has an even harder time hitting Kakarot than before, and Kakarot only has an easier time dodging. All the energy is returned, and the only remaining energy is all excess, and Kakarot has the perfect idea of what to do with this. With this excess energy, he lifts a hand up, dodging all of Moro's attacks while he does this. All the energy forms into his hand, going to a small ball of sorts. He thanks King Kai once more. He's going to use one of his master's signature techniques. The energy he takes from Moro is warped into a small spirit bomb of sorts, but a modified version that Kakarot made himself. Thanks to the help of spirit fission, it's a deadly combo. The energy he needs to fuel a spirit bomb is actually energy that he's forcefully sealing from Moro. And Moro sees this. Kakarot then throws a small spirit bomb towards him, opening his mouth ready to eat it. But he then feels an odd sensation. His snout is closed shut by Pycon's magic. With Krillin and Ten Shinhan's magic, his arms and legs are restrained, as Shin also tries to paralyze him. Moro's eyes widen as he sees the spirit bomb get closer, raising for impact as it makes direct contact. All of the energy flows right into him, being absorbed in the most wrong way possible. Everything goes silent, and suddenly, energy explodes in all directions out of Moro. Slowly, the evil magician dissipates. In a kinda ironic twist of fate, Moro was killed by his energy being stolen, with Kakarot there to claim victory. Far away, King Kai watches on, as well as Beerus and Whis. Beerus and Whis are glad it turned out this way, not only because they didn't have to get involved, but because it shows that their student is getting better and better. Hopefully he can fully master Ultra Instinct soon, and as for King Kai, he just feels more pride. Kakarot never ceases to impress him, not to mention, all the people around Kakarot have gotten much stronger too. The Earthlings, Pycon, even Namekians now, and a new Saiyan too. All those years ago, King Kai realized that it was a good choice to direct his space pod here. It helped the universe in more ways than one. Not only is there a strong warrior now, but another strong comedian, and that pleases King Kai. And with that, we'll leave off here for now. So, what did you guys think about this finale, and what did you think about the scenario as a whole? Leave your thoughts and suggestions in the comments below, I'll be sure to check them out to see what you guys think. As always, if you like the video, be sure to drop a like, and let's also try to hit that like over the beginning of the video. If you haven't already, or if you're new to the channel, why not subscribe, as well as hitting the bell icon to get notified about any future videos that I upload on my channel, including more content like this scenario. With that out of the way, I'd like to thank you all for watching, thanks for supporting this scenario, and I'll see you all in whatever video comes next. Hopefully you all enjoyed, and goodbye for now.